Okay, thanks everybody. Um, very hard to follow those two uh, talks and, and quite similar. I'm going to change the tone a little bit here, I'm afraid. <clears throat> so I'm going to stretch the, the definition of creativity and talk a little bit about how we think about creativity and the use of AI in uh, King Games. So I'm the CTO of King, and we're probably most known for Candy Crush. <clears throat> Hopefully many of you have played that game. I'm going to give you a bit of the insight into the business behind Candy Crush and how we've used AI over the last uh, you know, five, six years to, to improve the game for our you know, hundreds of millions of players. But um, AI and games has a long history, as I guess <clears throat> anybody who's familiar with the games industry would be uh, well aware. This is sort of cited as the first, maybe, example of AI in a computer game. Uh, you probably know Pac-Man, but each of the individual ghosts have personalities, very simple rule-based personalities. Some track the player's movement and some just do a, a random walk. Uh, so it imbued them with a certain personality. Um, more recently, or not, <laughs> not very recently, Commodore 64 game from the 80s. This is Little Computer People. I'm a big C64 uh, fan, so I had to get a, a mention in there. Again, this is an autonomous agent, effectively navigating a world, and a bit like a Tam Tamagotchi. You interacted with it, and it had its own sort of motivations and its own behavior. It's quite interesting. And closer maybe to here, uh, Lionhead, uh, Peter Molyneux's uh, black and white game, was uh, very well known for being the first example of reinforcement learning in computer games, and the main sort of character you see in the background, the monster was controlled. It adapted over time and learned the behavior of, of the player. And a little bit more recently, again, we have Left 4 Dead from Valve. Uh, this had an AI generating the camera and the storyline. So it actually, the story unfolded and it reacted to the player's presence in the game, uh, creating a sort of unique game experience each time, trying to create a certain tension. Now, lots happened uh, in the last year or so um, with the introduction of generative AI solutions really hitting public consciousness, large language models, mid-journey, DALI, chat GPT. Um, and it's fair to say that these are having a transformational impact on games, but it's nearly too early to say exactly what and exactly how. The industry itself is sort of in reaction mode and trying to understand how to leverage these technologies. One nice example from Stanford earlier this year was Storyville which is uh, a bit like a Sims-style game, uh, a world where characters sort of play out their daily lives. But in this case, each of the characters was imbued with a large language model intelligence, a sort of a chat GPT behind each one to decide what to do next. And then you just stand back and, and watch the simulation proceed. And it was quite mundane, but also quite interesting. Well worth a, a look at that paper. Now, in King's case, we've been using AI for quite some time, and uh, we've more recently, in the last couple of years, accelerated our usage of AI across how we develop our games. Now, we've been around for quite a while. Uh, King was founded in 2003, and we've released over 200 games uh, since our founding. Um, the one we know you probably will be aware of is Candy Crush. Just some fun stats. <laughs> Uh, 40 trillion swipes of color matches. It's a, a very simple puzzle game, right? Where you're presented with a grid, essentially a grid of different colored things that you try and match in threes, fours, or fives. And depending on the size of the match, you get sort of greater feedback or rewards. It's been played by billions of players so far. And we have over 200 million active players every, every month at the moment. Um, the currency of the game is our levels. So we have over 13,000 levels in the game. And that's essentially what people do they play the levels and progress over years and years and years. And we've many millions of players who are at what we call end of content. So they've played all 13,000 levels and they wait every week for us to release more levels. And that's how they you know, enjoy themselves, how they relax on a weekend or, or during a day. Our games are essentially three levels. And I'm just going to mention this to set some context for the AI we use. So at the fundamental level, it's a puzzle game where you're matching three to create, uh, uh, create fun experiences. A level above that, we sort of create a narrative. There's a linear sequence of levels where we create difficult levels, easy levels, to give the player a sort of a roller coaster journey. It'd be boring if they just got increasingly hard. It would also be boring if they were all essentially the same difficulty. So a lot of what we do is to try and craft the experience through the levels and the sequencing of the levels over time. And with 13,000 levels, there's a lot of stuff we can do over that uh, period. And it takes years to complete all the levels. And that's what we call our uh, saga. And essentially, it's a linear narrative, a story we tell through the levels. And then on top of that, again, we have 
what's more the business of running a game like this. Our games are free to play. The vast majority of players never pay anything, never watch ads or do anything. So they're completely free to experience the game as long as they wish. A small percentage decide to pay for in-game items and boosters and, and just skip levels and things like that. And then another percentage of players watch ads in order to progress. So that's our business. It's essentially finding those players who enjoy the game enough to either spend or to watch an ad to progress. Some of the things that we do on top of the game, though, are quite sophisticated. So we run international events. So for example, last week uh, we ran an, a global candy all-stars, which is trying to find the world's number one player, uh, which we hosted as a competition uh, in London last week. Uh, the previous year we ran a US competition with some celebrity endorsement. Um, and so we sort of bring the players back and give them a reason to come playing our games through live marketing and events and social activities that happen inside the game. So the game becomes more of a, a community hub for players who like this sort of experience. But fundamentally, it's about levels. And here are some of the levels across our different games. Um, and levels being the currency means we have to really understand how players play those levels and we have to essentially create the experience that we want to create for our players through the design uh, of our levels. And we've got many, many level designers, uh, and we've got lots of tooling, but one of the things we really do have is data. So over the last 20 years, we've had billions of players play our games, and over 230 million players are playing every month right now. So that's a lot of data that we capture on how people are playing our games. And this is where the, the data science, and this is where the AI comes in. Our job when we're crafting a level is to be very precise about the outcome. We're looking at the distribution of difficulty for different types of players. And what we've generated over time is a set of AI solutions that allow us to test levels and to test and play those levels as if a human was playing them. Because we don't have millions of testers. We have millions of players, but we don't want to be testing our levels in the players. We want to test them uh, you know, in, in our offices and hand curate the experience for our players. So we've developed lots of solutions from supervised to unsupervised learning. We use deep reinforcement learning. We've created bots that essentially play our levels over and over and over and over again. So before a level gets released, it's generally been played millions of times by an AI. And we're using the AI to sort of approximate a human. We're not trying to be better. We're not doing what DeepMind did with AlphaGo and, and beat the, the best human player. No, we're trying to be like a human. And we're also trying to be like different types of humans. Some people like easy levels, some people like an, a, a challenge. And so we're trying to bring all that together in the different forms of the AIs that we, that we produce. So a huge amount of effort goes into that. Our games then are a business, fundamentally. We, we don't exist if we don't have a business. And it's a sort of a, an unusual business, given that most of our customers don't pay us for the service that we provide, a small percentage do. So what we end up with is a, a complex, you don't need to read this slide, a complex dynamic system where we are looking to find users that we can bring into our games, find players. We do that through advertising, uh, essentially. So advertising all the different possible channels that you might imagine. When players are in the game, we're allowing them to experience the game. And then over time, we're trying to sort of deepen that experience, maybe get them to watch ads if they're prepared to watch ads to progress even faster. Sometimes players like to spend inside of our games, and they generally spend small uh, fractions of, of dollars to, to unlock a, a level. And then over time, those players will move on, move on to other games, hopefully other games that we create, but inevitably also other games that our competitors create. And then over time, we might want to bring those players back with something new. Maybe the next year we've released some new crazy feature, so we try and re-engage those players. So you get this dynamic system where players are flowing through this complex, very non-linear machine. So another way that we use AI is to try and understand that and, and try to optimize that. And at the core of this is a very... Very simple loop, players start playing, they play a level, then they engage in some way in the things that are outside the levels. They might share an experience with a friend, they might go into the store and buy a booster so they can get through the level a little quicker. Some of our players, for example, when they're going on international flights, like to buy a pack of like $5 worth of boosters so that there's no blocker through the flight. No matter how hard a level is, they can always just proceed and that's how they relax and, and get fun. And so we've got this loop. Players play a level, and then we engage with them in some way. And so we have opportunities, two different places to, to optimize this. One is, how do we get players in in the first place? And that's, that's really the, the hard end of the business. So we're looking to acquire players through ad networks, essentially. We advertise 
using digital advertising to players who may not know our games already. And we do that internationally, we do that uh, globally. And what we're trying to do is find the places where we can find players that are going to have the most fun and have the highest commercial potential for us, because again, we're a business. And so we observe, as we do advertising in different channels, on the right-hand side, you can see there's a curve which represents the lifetime value of a player over time or a, a group of players. So we're trying to predict as soon as possible, are the players that we are receiving from this particular advertising or this particular network, are they um, generating the sort of commercial returns that make sense? Do we get a, an ROI? Are we spending less than actually those players in aggregate are, are spending inside of our games? We're we spending less in advertising to them. It's a, a very slim margin game, but the intelligence comes in looking at the first couple of days of player behavior or groups of players and trying to decide what's going to happen over the next two years. And that's the sort of predictive qualities uh, that we use. And again, we've generated lots of AI solutions for this, and we're uh, excited by some of the, the more recent technologies to help us uh, drive that. This is actually the most competitive part of the industry, and we've got hundreds, thousands, in, indeed hundreds of thousands of games out there competing for your attention. And this is how we compete. We compete through the intelligence by which we advertise on the various different networks like Facebook and uh, uh, Snapchat. So let's imagine we've done a really good job of that. We've got players into our games. This is where I'm really stretching that creative terminology, by the way. This is business creativity, perhaps. Um, then inside of a game, this is where we get to, you know, We've optimized the levels, we've hopefully created a great experience, and now our job is to try and get a commercial outcome for ourselves, either through players watching an ad to progress, or through players visiting our store and buying an in-game item, which is generally an, an unlock, or a booster, or an extra life. So at different points in that core loop, we have opportunities to engage with a player. And again, that's where we look to use AI to try and decide what's the best thing to do next for this player. It's a recommendation engine that we develop over time. And given all these interaction points, and given all the different types of things we can do, we can't possibly hand curate that. So we rely very heavily on data. We rely very heavily on the artificial intelligence solutions to do that for us. And what we're doing is we're essentially optimizing that experience over the lifetime of a player. And that lifetime might be a day. It might be 10 years. We have players who've been playing Candy for over 10 years now, because it was 10 years old last year. So this for us is a sort of a reinforcement learning problem. You're, you're optimizing a policy over time for a player to try and give that player the best possible experience and to try and get us the best possible commercial outcome. So that's the balance as a business that you're always trying to find. So you can sort of get a sense for the different types of AIs that we use. It's not, uh, not nearly as inspiring, perhaps, as what we've heard from the, the previous speakers. Uh, but very much about how you create a business outcome using the very latest in these sorts of technologies. And we've used, we use and view AI as a, co a collaborator with all the uh, very great people that we have in our teams, our designers, our artists, our musicians, our coders, our business people, our data scientists, our analysts, all in some form use AI embedded in our, in our business process. So we felt so strongly about it that we bought an AI company last year. So we uh, were king. We're a game developer, but underneath that, we're a data company and an AI company. And we now have over 50 people directly involved in creating AI solutions and over 100 people across the business who are developing the tooling and the AI that we embed into our, into our games. And just to maybe close out on a little bit of that, what does it take to do that inside of a company like King? It's 2,000 people, but actually bringing AI right into the heart of the company, either you start that way, but King started more as a traditional game developer with a, a very strong emphasis on data. So we've had to transform the culture of the company to take advantage of the AI solutions that are out there. And even to the point that we have an AI ethics team inside of our company that's constantly looking at how we use AI, both from the classic, you know, are we introducing any biases? Are we sort of using this in a, in a sort of uh, a way that's non-optimal? But also looking at how we use AI to create game experiences. And are we crossing a boundary of fairness to our players? Should, how much personalization should we do inside of our games? We feel very passionately about creating fun um, and engaging experiences for the players, and we don't want to cross any lines. So we're constantly having an internal dialogue and an engagement about that, both with our players, but also with our company itself through the AI ethics team. And we've also invested in AI training and enablement right at the heart of our company, where everybody in King gets, to, gets an opportunity to engage with our AI training team 
do hack days and really understand what AI can do for our business. And it's all of those things together that I think have helped really you know, grow King over the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, that's really all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your time.